everyone. My name is Matt Pallady, and I'm the president of Lambda Pi Eta, and we are putting on this show tonight. So first of all, I'd like to thank all of you for coming out and getting the opportunity to see Matt Barkley and Tim Tesselone in action. Um, thank you, Dan. I'm not finished with you yet, okay? A special thanks to Dan Durbin for coming out and hosting this and moderating it for us. Not hosting. Um, so thank you again for coming. This is a rare opportunity to see kind of the inside secrets behind the media for what sports people, what sports, uh, what our famous athletes have to go through and their coaches. So we'll get started and Dan Durbin, I'll hand it off to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Matt. Uh, everybody give Matt a round of applause. He actually, you know, we get to sit up here and yickety yak. Matt actually has to go to the work of putting this stuff together. So, you know, you, you should be thanking him, if anyone, at the start. Now, just for those of you who don't know, and start getting ready to fill out your scorecards right now. Uh, Tim Tesselone, of course, is the Sports Information Director at your University of Southern California Athletic Department, uh, the, the home of the USC Trojans sports teams. So if you want to give Tim a little applause. <laughs> is, is this is this not an applause signifier to you? Yeah. Um, it would seem to me. Anyway, uh, and also, you, I don't know if you've, we've got this young guy. Um, and, and he showed up a couple of years ago and he started playing football for us. And you may not have heard his name. Uh, I'm telling you right now, you'll hear about it next year. If you haven't heard about it before, you'll probably hear about it next year. The quarterback of your USC Trojans football team, Matt Barkley. And we're, we're going to talk about several things, and before the end of the evening, if Matt doesn't get ticked off at me and deck me, I'll, I'll have counted this a failed conversation. Um, but before, I, I, I want to start with, uh, by talking with Tim, but before we do, there's, a, there's an issue that has not been resolved, uh, and, and I do want to ask it. Uh, Matt, do you or don't you? Touch up the hair. <laughs> not like you. <laughs> <laughs> I just, all it takes is one hand. No, 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 no. no. Is this a natural blonde or are you an this Orange County natural. blonde? This is, this is Orange County right here. This, no, this <laughs> no, Orange County means, you, you know, there, there's something coming from a bottle on that. Nothing, nothing about it. Okay, we'll come back to that discussion. <laughs> well, I frost, oh, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> well, I defrost, but that's a whole different story. Um, in any case, or they defrost me and then they send me out to go do work. Uh, in any case, I want to start with Tim because Tim has, has had a, a tenure here and has had to deal with uh, all of these issues for a number of years over a number of, of great years and a number of years in which things weren't so great and times when there were scandals that, that had to be dealt with. Uh, but I, I want to begin, first of all, by asking Tim, when did you first work in sports information at USC? Well, I actually worked in, uh, in the office area in Heritage Hall when I was a student a sen my senior year. Um, yeah, that was in the 76, 77 mm -hmm. season. So uh, believe it or not, his father was playing water polo here back then. So uh, that's how long I've been, been around here and uh, worked there for, uh, as a student, had the opportunity to stay there. Uh, they were expanding the office and had the opportunity to stay full time. And I kind of said, no, I want to get out in the real world and wear a coat and tie and see what the real world, world was like. So I turned that job down, went and worked at a PR agency in, in LA for two years. Um, and what I discovered really was that my love was the day-to-day -day sports thing and had the opportunity to come back in 79 and uh, has, have been here ever since. Kind of too dumb to do anything else, I think. So. <laughs> well, many of us could say that about our 10 years here. Uh, now, as we all know, in 1976, I was just a glint in my father's eye, so I don't remember the bicentennial here. Um, that's known as a joke, people. Uh, this is going to be a hard crowd. I'm just <laughs> warning you guys right now. Um, and by 1979, you're back here. <laughs> Talk to us for just a second about the media that you had to face then. When you had to uh, put out sports information on USC, what were the primary media you went to? Well, Matt would be surprised by this, but back in 1979, and we have our esteemed LA Times beat writer Gary Klein here. He was not our beat writer back then. There was a fellow named Matt Mal Florence of the LA Times. Mm -hmm. But back in those days, uh, we rarely had media come to practice. Mm -hmm. Maybe once a couple weeks there'd be some, a media person show up. Now, as you know, uh, we have five, six, seven newspaper reporters and some of their sidebar people. We have four, five, six website 
and, and all of their people. We have campus media, we have TV stations, and that's just on a normal day. Uh, on a big day, a big game or something, it really expands. So back then it was way different. It was the, the communication with the media was way different. It was maybe a phone call, maybe something called a telecopier machine, which was a precursor <laughs> of a fax machine. It's um, about the time you used to send up smoke signals, actually. And, right? and if something happened in our world and mm -hmm. we didn't want it to get out, it, it, the earliest it would get out would be the next morning's newspaper. Now, if Matt says something crazy here tonight, you guys are going to tweet it. I know that, and it'll be out right away. So that's that's the and, difference. And that is a that is a significant complication. And I think that's what's uh, one of the things that's really interesting about your job is the sheer uh, uh, immediacy of what you have to do now. Uh, and you you mentioned a any sort of uh, scandal or problem happens, or or Matt says something. Uh, that we hope he doesn't, uh, and and you end up having to deal with it essentially immediately. Um, talk about a little bit about the cycle in 1979. You are trying to get press for USC for uh, a, a sporting event or some other activity. Uh, who do you call up? How do you go about doing that? How do you build up the press interest at the time? Well, we're fortunate, and this is a little arrogant, but at USC there's going to always be an interest in our, in our sports, and especially our, our marquee sports like football and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and basketball, baseball, some of the volleyballs. But, um, you know, it, it was a lot of relationship building back then. Uh, the media was different back then, and we were right on the kind of the cusp of the change from two things happened. Watergate happened. Mm -hmm. And in the sports world, I always think the, the book Ball Four. Has anybody ever read that book, Ball Four, by Jim Bouton? Uh, that really changed how the media covered sports. Mm -hmm. Before that time, uh, the media was almost like lapdogs to, to athletes. Mm -hmm. and athletes were idols. They were on a pedestal. And uh, the media did not, anything bad that happened, the media looked the other way. When uh, Watergate came down and, and kind of the investigative style of media happened, ball four. Um, media, uh, athletes were no longer uh, idolized and they were, uh, you know, up for being hit left and right by the media. And that was, right when I was starting, that was starting to happen. You know, we were getting investigative reporters, enterprise media, and so it, it got a little tougher, but we still had a lot of media who loved USC and would write whatever uh, they would write in glowing positive terms, and, mm -hmm. and uh, it was a lot easier back then, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as, as we all know with TMZ, uh, anything that comes out, potentially something to catch USC on, or to catch, really to catch USC's players in order to catch USC, because we are uh, the marquee sports school in Southern California. And in many respects, it's a marquee, one of the two or three marquee sports institutions in all of Southern California, including professional institutions. Um, when you have to deal with a problem today, for instance, somebody <laughs> says something coming out of a club in Hollywood or some other place, mm -hmm. and it immediately goes to TMZ, what's the immediacy in terms of how you have to deal with it? And what's your first goal? Well. You know, you, in a crisis situation, something like that, you always want to get to the you want to get to the facts, and you want to find out what really happened and hear all sides of the story. Um, you know, you're talking about TMZ in a club in Hollywood. You're talking about Mark Tyler's situation uh, this past year. Uh, you know, you, have, you want to talk to Mark, find out what happened, find out from the guys that were there, and, and see if it's being portrayed accurately, um, and so on and so forth. There's some damage control you can try to do, but again, in this now that everybody has a cell phone and and they document. You know, Mark acted stupid that night, and he'd tell you that. Uh, he didn't get some help from some buddies of his that were there that should have fended him away from, from the media that was there. Um, but, we, you know, we, our thing is we took some action with Mark, some disciplinary action, and we made sure people knew that we did. And, and we got Mark out in front of people, uh, media, in a very apologetic role or way, um, and, you know, let people know that he felt bad for what he did and he, he made a mistake. You know, they're, they're kids, they're human. Mm -hmm. It's going to happen. Matt, I don't want you to think we've forgotten about you. Um, now, you, you're in the middle of this, and, and again, this is just a fact. The quarterback position at USC is, again, one of the star positions in Southern California, and this is, this is not kissing up to you or anything. I mean, it, it simply is. You are now, right now, a sports star in Southern California, whether you want to be or not. 
you also have access to media that in 1979, Tim couldn't have even dreamt about. And you live on those media, as we all know. You've got a Twitter account. You've got all, all sorts of other media that you, you interact with. Uh, first of all, let's talk in a negative voice. How do you protect yourself in this environment? Well, I'd say, first of all, I've learned a lot about how to protect myself over the course of the last uh, five, six years, even when I was in high school, because I went to a high school, modern day high school, which um, had a pretty good athletic reputation. I mean, that's where Matt Leinart went. Um, we have two Heisman Trophy winners, um, and our, I mean, our basketball program is on the board on the map nationally every year. So we get a lot of press, and so I was kind of made aware of that attention in high school. And then coming to USC, I knew what I was getting myself into. You know, growing up watching guys like Carson Palmer, Matt Leiner, and all, all those guys, and what they had to deal with. Um, but it is an age even that has changed so much since when those guys were playing. And mm -hmm. with the with the internet, internet, you know how that's changed so much. I've had to. Um, you really have to watch what you say at, at all times because you never know who is going to snap a picture or. Um, and and every, anything you see on the internet is is there in words forever. You know, even though if you take it off a minute later, someone probably got a screenshot of it. It's it's not like you can you say something. Probably out of that. Somebody, they somebody definitely has take a, a screenshot. Of it. Yeah. Whether it's a screenshot or not. So record, yeah. yeah. So your words are almost immortalized now. W w even if you're saying them to a person, you know, someone can overhear them and write them down. So uh, it, it just makes you aware that you always kind of have to be on your guard and. Mm -hmm. um, you just got to be careful with what you say. What exactly you how old are you? 21. 21 year olds are not meant to be mature enough to deal with all of this, but you're forced to. I mean, you're in a situation where this is, an, a, in all honesty, an unhealthy environment for you. Uh, a, now, you've, you have had, said things that have been controversial in the past, and, and, uh, and by the way, this is nothing new. This happened to Mark, this happened to yeah. Matt before you. Uh, this is a, cons a common place here. Uh, but anything you say or do, as you say, it, it is immediately known and there's an immediate response. Um, part of what you do in order to deal with that beforehand, I assume, is to try to build up uh, a Matt Barkley brand. Who is Matt Barkley publicly? So I want to ask you that question first of all. Who is Matt Barkley publicly? Who are you trying to build up as a character for the public uh, in, in your tweets and in your other interactions with the media and with the news? Well, on, at least on Twitter, which is the main source of uh, social networking that I use, I, I just I like to be myself. And you see that when I talk about um, like computer stuff or kind of geek stuff and USC football and, um, and even some personal things which have gotten me in trouble at times. Um, but I do want to put off the reputation, not just tweet all about USC football, kind of like a standardized you know, machine would tweet, but kind of let the fans see a part of me that they wouldn't normally see unless they were around Heritage Hall all the time. And so that has its pros and cons. Um, but I do want people to see who I really am. And I think it's true when I am talking to the media, whether that's in interviews or in front of the camera, um, I want to be myself. But there are times when you you have to, I mean, you can't be 100% honest all the time. It's, it's just not the truth. And when, when I do do that, um, which I have had a tendency to do, I mean, an example last year, I was just talking about my um, buddy I played with against in high school, Vontez Burkvik. I was just describing him as I knew it, and I was being honest and what I thought would be okay, and I get reprimanded by the Pac-12 for, for what I said. When I mean, it's true, yeah, it's true, but I mean, you can't always say what's true all the time. That can hurt you. So um, I think, you know, my reputation, whatever it is, um, as being truthful and everything, you do have to be conscious of the fact that even if you are genuine to yourself and true, that might rub people the wrong way. Yeah, uh, the, well, it certainly will. Uh, and I want to get further and further into that discussion a little bit because you, obviously you're dealing with um, issues that other people have dealt with before you in one way or another, uh, except you're dealing with it, you're dealing with them not only on a platform at USC, but on a platform at Twitter and on a, in a variety of other places where you simply right. exist. Yeah. Again, whether you want to or not, you exist there. That's, Correct. that's the way the, the system works. Uh, so to, to attack the thing, first of all, uh, in, in a, a, a lighter or simpler vein, uh, let me ask you, who, who is Matt Barkley? Because you didn't answer that question. You went all the way around. Yeah, that's right. uh, and who is Matt Barkley uh, who sits around looking at sunsets all the time? 
Who's yeah, that see, character? Durbin that's... checks his Twitter once yeah. a year, and the one time he did, <laughs> no, I tweeted no. a picture of a cloud or something. No, no, this is not true. You have done this more than once. Don't give me any crap about this. You have done oh, this more than once. I did. I did go on a. I was on an Instagram just blast when I would send out and ask people for sunsets. There are beautiful sunsets, by yeah. the way. So, <laughs> I thought it was pretty cool. But this is. But there's a distinction between, as you say, you can't be truly Matt Barkley 100 percent in this communication. But you can show elements of Matt Barkley. But those elements then create a separate Matt Barkley, the public Matt Barkley. And who is that person? Well, I think it, it has a lot to do with the fact that I'm a Trojan and what it, what it means to be a Trojan and and kind of that, that leader aspect of the quarterback who I am um, is portrayed a lot through, through my tweets, whether it's um, talking about USC events or other players on our team, kind of lifting them up or talking about you know our upcoming year or, or even what I like. Um, but I think that component, it, it see, Twitter is, is an interesting tool because it can be so narcissistic if you want it to. And um, even things you say to try to lift up your team or other people can just be seen like it's all about me, it's all about me. So that's something I've found as, as a struggle of, you know, how do I portray how I feel about, uh, you know, either a game I'm watching I mean, like during the national championship game, the football national championship game between LSU and Alabama, um, anyone watch that game? Yeah. It wasn't like the most explosive, exciting game, right? And so <laughs> I, just, I just tweeted, bored, dot, dot, dot. And yeah. I was your, tweeting this what... people in Louisiana real happy. Right, right. didn't make them too, <laughs> too excited. And that's what I was feeling, it was honest, right? But, well, if somebody had thrown five touchdowns in the game, yeah, that, that wouldn't have worked. Yeah. But even even still, you know, I'm trying to just to be be real and, and describe the situation. But sometimes that's not always, always your place. Yeah. And so, you know, I've realized that just based on experience and you know the feedback you get. Um, does that answer your question? <laughs> kind of detoured. <laughs> not really. Uh, you're talking <laughs> all brand. around it once again. Uh, and, uh, let me say one thing about the sunsets. <laughs> and, and your comments about, uh, about the uh, Trojan legends, Pat Hayden and uh, J.K. McKay, all of that. Uh, and then I want to talk about uh, some specific instances, and I want you both to comment on the first one. Um, they, uh, now, my first response when I looked at the sunsets thing was, sunsets? <laughs> what, what, what is this guy thinking? And then I realized as you're getting responses and responses and responses, this actually was building up a public Matt Barkley who was a guy who likes sunsets and is laid back in his L.A. and his Orange County. Yeah. That's a, that, on the one side, is a perfectly safe Matt Barkley for you yeah. to sell to the public. And, and at some point, you're going to have to sell this to NFL organizations, and you're going to have to sell this to a much larger public through the NFL, uh, you know, assuming you make it into a, an organization. You know, part of your job is to work to be quarterback of, an, of a professional organization. Part of your job is to represent that organization as it is here. Correct. So you're going to have another stage to do the same things. So on the one side, that and, and your tweets about uh, Pat and JK and other things work very well to create an, an kind of an affable public image of Matt Barkley. We assume you're less affable on the football field, one would hope, <laughs> yes. and that you are trying to defeat the other team and, Correct. and uh, it, it, in no uncertain terms. Let's talk about one instance here. Uh, as you all, uh, both of you, uh, I'm sure recall relatively well, uh, at one point, Mark Sanchez decided that he was going to leave USC and enter the NFL draft, and it created a windfall of press and reactions and not necessarily comfortable reactions on campus from Pete Carroll. And, uh, and uh, you know, it's something that really ended up be becoming one of the most memorable moments of, of Mark's tenure here at USC. Um, what did you both learn? I want to start with Tim. What did you learn from that situation uh, about the complexities of dealing with, uh, with the media today in, uh, at USC? <laughs> well, you know, that day started off really as just Mark making an announcement. Mm -hmm. We kind of knew what it was going to be. Uh, and then about maybe 10 minutes before, uh, we were gonna, the way we set it up is we were going to have Pete Carroll down there and, and Mark down there, and it was going to be a little bit of a love fest and, um, <laughs> in front of the media. And then Pete says, you know, I, real, I want to say some things. I mm -hmm. want to say what I think. And, and he kind of told us what he was going to say, and we said, well, here's the pushback you're going to get. And, you know, we can't tell you not to say that, but um, 
you know, in that hurried five, ten minutes before the press conference, this is kind of the direction he went. And you have to understand that that's Pete Carroll. Mm -hmm. Pete's a competitor, and yeah. he's going to compete till the clock says zero mm -hmm. to try to win his guys back. And you know, I don't think Pete said it in a way that was that was offensive to Mark, because Mark didn't really take it that way. Um, you know, and, and I think if you see if you talk to both of them now, you'd understand it better that way. But um, it certainly did create, as, as you say, uh, what a firestorm or whatever among among the media, among the fans, and, and there seemed to be an obvious conflict between the two of them. Um, you know, ever since that, that time, I've always said, well, why do we even do these kind of press conferences? Mm -hmm. If somebody's staying or somebody's going, just put out a statement, a press release, or whatever. Now, having said that, you guys all saw what he did on a couple days before Christmas and how well he did that and how positively that was received. Um, now, if he said he was leaving, I'm wondering how that would have with the band and the Christmas tree and the how that would have, <laughs> how would have that have played? Yeah, you know? well, I, we definitely would have done it differently. You're right, because might not have done a press conference. Might not have even done anything. Yeah. So, you know, those those things are you flip a coin sometimes in those situations. And again, we thought Mark's thing was going to be all lovey dovey, and it, it turned a little bit of a, a controversial. Yeah. Uh, well, you know the. That's one of the difficulties of the media, uh, because no matter what happens in that room and, and how well, they're feeling toward each other, it plays out, of course, nationally as as a huge falling out between coach and player, and that's because the media are right on top and at top of it, and they're creating that message. Well, not only the media. I mean, that thing was broadcast live. Yeah. Everybody saw that thing live. So not, the media, in that sense wasn't necessarily shaping opinions, creating opinions with their stories, because everybody saw that yeah. right there. But, and, uh, but that is media creating it because it's going over media, and it's the fact that people right. are seeing it physically live. And this goes back to the comment about 1979. You probably wouldn't have had to deal with this, because if you had a press conference, the, you know, the likelihood that there would have been mass national and international media covering it, and right. it would go out over the internet instantaneously would have been nil. Right. Uh, so you, you would have been able to shape the story before it really got traction in the media. And even then, it'd be a story the next day on the news, as opposed to mm -hmm. something that people are seeing with that kind of immediacy. And that becomes then a, a tremendous challenge for someone like you, who's having to change your game plan every yeah. year to deal with new media. Yeah, and you know, really what this does for us is we're chasing stories now all the time. Yeah. And it's very hard for us, for teams, whatever, organizations, to be out in front Mm -hmm. of the news anymore. Yeah. Um, and the only way we can really seem to do that is to become our own news source, if you will. And we do that through things like our, our website, our blog. We even make Team this... Martin. Huh? Team Martin. We, yeah, we even make this guy a source of news. And we had him tweet when we hired uh, one of our assistant football coaches. And he broke the news yeah. uh, through his Twitter. So, um, you know, we have to become kind of the news source in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, you've, you've done that at different times in the past. When he was a student of mine, Brandon Hancock was producing a diary until he got injured, a diary of the, uh, mm -hmm. the football season was, was the concept. And so you were able to get out your story and your version of the right. story. Um, and and that, that then helps you have control of that story as everyone, uh, especially someone like Tiger Woods knows, once you lose control of your story, you're deep, deep trouble. Right. You always want to have the first word, the, mm -hmm. because the first word is seemingly the strongest and people have to react off of that. But mm -hmm. so often now what we end up doing is, you know, Gary's going to be there and he's going to find something out and he's going to write it or tweet it or post it right away. Mm -hmm. And now we have to react yeah. to, to that. And, and that, mm -hmm. that's challenging. Yeah, that's it's difficult. <laughs> yeah, there's a, 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 I've told students any number of times, there's an old Father Brown story by G.K. Chesterton uh, called The Scandal of Father Brown. Father Brown was a detective character. Uh, and the, the, the story, the point of the story was there was no scandal, but the, the uh, scandal story had gotten out in the press. And the fact that there was no scandal got in the, out in the press a half an hour after the scandal story. Yeah. And Chesterton ends the story saying, for the rest of eternity, the, the lie was out in the press, and 30 minutes later, the truth was chasing it down around the world. Yeah. You know, that's, that's, true. That, that's almost what you end up being. What did you learn from Matt, Mark Sanchez's? Uh, well, I remember that was the first spring I got here. Mm -hmm. So I was fresh out of high school, mm -hmm. my first couple weeks at USC. 
And I remember I was in this room actually uh, for Jeff Fallinzer's 380 class, a journalism class, and Shelly Smith was the guest speaker that night. Mm -hmm. And she was talking about, so the whole class was kind of about Mark's decision, which was kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. And the whole thing was kind of crazy to me because, you know, I, I decided to come here early, well before Mark even considered leaving. I thought he was going to stay, I was going to learn under him. And so I get here and he's going through this whole ordeal. And one of my first week of classes, we're talking about him, you know, his decision with an ESPN reporter. And so it was kind of cool to me to hear how that whole you know, progression happened. And when he decided to leave, the, kind of, the image that I got as, you know, as a young teenager was that, and I knew from being on the inside, you know, Coach Carroll's feelings to, uh, to Mark and what that really meant. But my, the image still in my head is that they had a fight pretty much. Like, and he didn't, they didn't get along with the decision. And you know, I know, you know, after being with Coach Carroll for a year and, and his competitive spirit that he talked about, I know exactly what he was talking about. And I know Mark didn't take anything personally, and it was fine. But that initial image you get in your head is pretty important as to how a story is portrayed. Yeah. And to a lot of people, it was the fact that they don't get along. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, it's just something you have to, you know, again, be, be aware of. Yeah, but. be aware of and work around and, and create a, an alternate, narr alternate narrative. But Mark never has been able to, nor has Pete, been able to create an alternate narrative of that that, that, that the media or the public have bought. So that, that, yeah. that's the, you know, kind of the nuclear danger there uh, in that situation. Um, Matt, let's, let's talk about another situation uh, and, and let's, let's watch you squirm. Um, Oh because it's something that, you, that, again, that you have to face now and you will have to face in the future. Uh, coming out not too far distantly from Mark Sanchez at USC, uh, on the other side of the country was a guy named Tim Tebow. Uh, Tim Tebow has, has been very open uh, about expressing his Christian faith and his beliefs uh, and has, has not only been public about that, but has been, uh, pardon the uh, using the term this time of year, but he's been crucified publicly <laughs> for this. Uh, now you uh, have a, in many respects a similar background uh, and you have expressed uh, some similar points of view, uh, but you've seen what Tebow has had to go through. What do you learn first of all from Tim Tebow's situation? Well I think Tim is, is an interesting person to, to kind of watch and to mm -hmm. take in because he, uh, well first of all we're very different mm -hmm. personalities. Mm -hmm. uh, we share a lot of the same beliefs, but we're different players, we're different personalities. But to see the way he's carried himself through his college career, you know, in the SEC and, and all that has to, you know, goes on there, and you know, transitioning into the NFL and all the questions around him, um, I I admire him for the fact that he he's never swayed in his beliefs. He hasn't tried to fit a mold to try to be someone that people want him to be. He's he's stuck to who he is, as as a player and as as a person. And uh, yeah, he's dealt with with a lot of you know crap in, in his career from from fans and from people. But I think his charisma and the fact that he can you know lead a team and be that guy in the in the huddle or in the locker room has kind of overshadowed the stuff that people may not believe in or agree with him on. Yeah. And so that's something I've kind of learned with him. And um, you never really saw him stepping on anyone's toes specifically. Mm. Like he'll be upfront about the fact that he believes in God and everything, but down to, down to specifics, you won't see him um, like beating on someone's head or um, really trying to um, or be too specific mm. in, in things. And that's something that I've, I've kind of learned from him. No, you know, however, that that doesn't help. Yeah. <laughs> that there still is going to be negative conversation yeah. uh, coming out, and there are going to be attacks. And, yeah. and uh, you, 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 this is, is, I'm sure, growing up, uh, this has been part of the discussion of your faith, mm -hmm. uh, that people who don't agree with you are liable to attack, attack you publicly. And you having a stage, uh, the stage both for you to be able to communicate is set you up also to, as a stage to be pilloried. Uh, you know, looking forward to moving toward the NFL, how do you communicate your faith in such a way for yourself that you're comfortable on the one side that you're being true to yourself and true to your faith, and on the other side uh, that that you uh, you know you do it in, in the the most effective way, uh, but also the one that, that potentially would be uh, least offensive. 
I, I think that's, for, a, that's a, the, the last two words on that were unfair. Take no, out I, least offensive. No, that, no, that's no, unfair to you. Let's take the, the first part of it. I, I think for me, uh, it is important that I remain you know, genuine to, to who I am and remember where I came from and all that stuff. But at the same time, um, you have to find that balance between just an overconsumption of, of you know, fans to, to what you believe and what you say. Because you're, first and foremost, to people, you're a football player. Mm -hmm. You know, I may not look at myself that way, but to, to your fans and to everyone following you, that's, that's what you are to them. And so that's what they want. And the occasional um, belief or personal anecdote to kind of figure out who you are, mm -hmm. that they're okay with that. But a constant barrage of this is what I believe, this is what you should believe, they, they don't want to hear that. Yeah. And, I mean, I think you, sh you should be bold and upfront about who you are, though. And, mm -hmm. you know, I admire that. I mean, if you guys watched the Masters this weekend, you know, Bubba Watson, who won it, if you check his Twitter timeline, he was tweeting Bible verses and all that stuff and, and giving glory to God. And if you, if you don't agree with him, then you, you, know, you don't have to be a fan or even, you can still like the way he plays golf. Um, but I mean, he's bold about that and he's, uh, you know, he's a superstar in a sense as well. So I don't think you can back down just because you have a broader audience now, but you have to be careful of, um, you know, still saying the right things, but not really shoving it down people's throats, I yeah. think. Yeah. <laughs> well, you, you can't back down and be true to yourself or true to your faith. Um, uh, but then you, you look at it as having really having to step up on several fronts. Correct. Um, Tim, speaking of, uh, of Matt Barkley, uh, let's act as if he's not here for the moment. You're creating a Matt Barkley, and, and especially going into the next football season, you're creating a Matt Barkley at USC to sell to the public and to sell to the press. Who is that Matt Barkley? Well, I, that Matt Barkley has been so exposed out there, it's actually a challenge for us to find new stuff to talk about <laughs> him, because yeah. everybody knows you everything. You about sunsets, apparently. <laughs> that might be the thing we do, cover our media guide, mm -hmm. even walking out of a sunset. Yeah. Um, <laughs> playing the guitar. <laughs> playing the guitar. Um, so a little bit of our challenge is what are the new storylines for the media to do to cover, you know, to write about Matt? Because uh, there is a, a sense, you know, we're not going to hide things here. We're obviously thinking this guy might win the Heisman Trophy this year. Mm -hmm. And so there's some things we need to do to keep him out there. Um, and fortunately, he's going in this season as, you know, the leading contender for the Heisman and all that. So a lot of the groundwork that we would normally have to do for a player has already been done by his performance on the field. Um, and this whole Heisman Trophy thing is a very... Uh, tenuous kind of campaign that you carry out and that we've learned a lot over the years from the Carson Palmer era to to now and how all this this sort of thing works that a lot of it has to do with timing and playing well at the end of the year and on a good team and having you know the voting end right at the right time and so on and so forth but we have some things some things we don't even want to share yet that uh, we're gonna pop out there uh, different communication strategies if you will yeah, um, you can share it with us we're not gonna tell anybody <laughs> This guy back there, nothing's off the, nothing's off the record. Plug his ears. We've got, we got 30 people here. But we think, you know, we think yeah. we, we've always tried to be kind of a, ahead of the curve. Uh, uh, those things you talked about, the Brandon Hancock, you know, the blogs. And we were, we were doing athlete blogs and, and mm -hmm. video blogs with athletes way before anybody else was. Yeah. Um, and, and we think we've got another thing here coming that, that's going to be, you know, a little bit out of the box uh, mm -hmm. that Matt will be involved in and, and a lot of our, our players will be involved in. So uh, I think it is kind of a struggle struggle too to find that new way of branding yourself You've, mm -hmm. you know I'm, we have been developing this brand of myself but I, you know it's been my fourth year here as, as a starter mm -hmm. and people have known me for quite some time though when you ask you know what are your hobbies they don't they <laughs> kind of want to hear something <laughs> new for car, whatever reason right, right? Look they don't, at sunset. yeah they hear, they hear the same things over and over again but you know unfortunately in today's day and age you, you have to be creative with with headlines and, and content to kind of keep fans engaged and yes, yeah, and in all honesty, I mean that be it is oh Lord, no way I can make this sound either good or bad. Uh, uh, in some respects, that's that's more difficult with you. You are you don't go out and do uh, too many knuckleheaded things. You don't go out and uh, you know uh, cause massive riots someplace. So you're very low key. Uh, you, you follow your P's and Q's. I think you even use knives and forks, right, if I recall. Um, so it's, it's very difficult to create you as, as a cutting edge image. You're also from Orange County, so you're a pure Southern California guy. Yes. Uh, so this is, 
you know, it, it, it has to be hard to create fire out of. Well, and that, you know, that's the thing this year. Think about it. He's, he's here yeah. right now. And it's you either stay here or what else do you do? Yeah. You do this. You know, yeah. we've, we've kind of discussed that. That mm -hmm. the, We saw it this year with Andrew Luck a little bit. I was talking to the, my counterpart at Stanford. Yeah. He said it was amazing that even within games, if Andrew Luck threw a pick, suddenly people, media, were tweeting, there goes his Heisman chances. Yeah. One interception in the middle of a you know, game that didn't this mean is, anything. Uh, this is actually interesting because speaking of your LA Times, um, so uh, this has always fascinated me. When Norm Chow left USC, uh, mm -hmm. we just won the, uh, the uh, national championship. And Bill Plaschke wrote an article in which he said, uh, now um, Pete Carroll has a chance to prove that he's a great coach. If he wins another national championship, he's, you know, he can prove that he's one of the, be the best coaches in college football. He didn't even say of all time, one of the best college coaches in college football. If he doesn't win a national championship without Norm Chow, he's just another coach. That changes. I mean, well, the, guy, the guy got within 10 seconds of winning another national championship, and now he's just another coach. I mean, that, your, your level of playing has changed once the media and the audience perceives you as being uh, a, a certain type of player. Yeah, so if you don't have as many touchdown passes in a given game or you have more uh, uh, interceptions, suddenly Matt Barkley's faltering. But my guess is you love it like this. Yeah, I love it, and at the same time, I've learned to to tune all that stuff out. Yeah, I mean, when it comes down to it, I during the season, I I don't watch Sports Center, I don't listen to the radio, I don't I don't read articles, just because the the media can do so much to you, positively and negatively. They can they can build me up all season. They can I can read all these things about how great we're going to be and and all the chances for success. But I could, I could read one article where someone just slams me, you're overrated, all this stuff. <laughs> so it can build you to be so arrogant, but then you can just slam me down. And I don't, I don't really see the benefit in, yeah. in participating in that because that's not going to help me you know, on the field. It's not going to help our performance. And um, I think it's good you know, for, for guys like Tim to keep me informed of what's going on from that perspective. And that's why I think we work right together with all those guys in Sports Info. But for me personally, First and foremost is football and what happens on the field, and then you have to be aware of all the stuff that happens in the media, but not you can't focus on it at all. Okay, so what is your unfinished business? Spell it out. U <laughs> Gary Klein's N F I N I. <laughs> yes, no I'm kidding. Um, that was a delayed laugh, by the way. I don't know if you guys got that at first. Well, they were thinking Ultimate Fighter <laughs> or something there, and it got it got a little weird in the in the translation. Well, I, I think, you know, that our unfinished business is to be the best. And, you know, we've kind of been uh, out, out, of the, out of the mix for, for two years now. And the chance to come back with, with all the players that we have, uh, a lot of players on this team, you know, not just me, a lot of players on this team up for preseason awards and All-American status and all that stuff. And, um, you know, with Coach Kiffin getting more uh, – Credibility, cred yeah, getting more credibility now with both the media and fans. I think um, I, I wanted wanted to be a part of, of what we're going to do this year, and I think it's going to be so special because of, of the team that we have, of, of the guys. I, I've never been closer to a team, mm -hmm. um, and just to see what we're capable of. I think that's the, the unfinished business and what we've been missing out in the last couple of years. Do you think Wayne lacked credibility last year? I don't think last year. No, I think at least with the team, he, he had us the whole year. Mm -hmm. and, and that's, I think, what kind of switched. Two years ago when he first got here, there was definitely some backlash from players mm -hmm. and just resistance because we wanted the old way with Coach Carroll, and he was trying to bring in a new regime that was completely different. We wanted fun. He was very stern and direct. Mm -hmm. And I think last year we, we kind of met in the middle, and we talked to him about – you know, as players, we need to have, you know, fun and music practices and fun in meetings or whatever that looks like. And so um, last year we meshed really well. And here in the credibility of the players as a player's coach, and I think that's why we were, we were having so much fun. And you really saw it towards the end of the season mm -hmm. when we were clicking. And, and I think that caught on nationally as well with, with the media and with fans. They started to see that, you know, he, 
he doesn't always look too nice on the sidelines with <laughs> never smiles. But you know, with yeah, us, never has he, the hair out of place. He looks great on the sidelines. Oh, it's the visor that does yeah, it. Yeah, well, there you, you know? go. Yeah, I'll do it every time. Uh, you know, there's one last thing on that. Um, you know, you don't have the luxury of being just another player. Uh, you are the the uh, perceived as the leader of the team. You're perceived as being again the star player, the separate player in that. Uh, and so you you know you uh, in a sense stand in the public's eye between Coach Kiffin and the uh, the football team. Uh, how do you deal with that yourself in your dealings with the coach, with the football team, and within yourself? Well, it was an interesting thing when I was going through the, the whole sanctions things when that first happened when we didn't have a we didn't have a coach we didn't have a athletic director I don't think we had a president either and naturally that you know who's the next leader in line of at least for the football team it goes with the quarterback and so a lot of that leadership rests on you by default and um, I've learned a lot through this process of being a vocal leader, first of all, of having to step up and kind of be that face of, of the school when, when you have to. And it's been interesting to see that grow as I've learned to be vocal on the field and as well you know, in the locker room with players, um, but also with the media and, and the fans as they kind of elevate me, um, I think sometimes unnecessary, but uh, you know, they elevate that quarterback just because of you know, the nature of the position. and. Um, I, I mean, I've always embraced it. It was, it was kind of the same way in high school, and I learned learned that in high school. And um, you know, it has its pros and cons. You you have to step out of your comfort zone. You have to be that voice, but you get to lead your team as well. And it's something. It's a position I love to be in. I mean, my personality. I love. I'm the type of guy who loves being in control. I like holding the remote on the sofa. Mm -hmm. I love. In, in every sport, I was I was the pitcher. I was the center midfielder, the point guard. And, you know, quarterback just has those characteristics as well. It all has to be about you, doesn't it, man? Um, so back to the unanswered question about, uh, at least not fully answered question about um, the unfinished business. Obviously, being the best means being a national champion. Uh, and being the best personally means uh, being competing for and winning a Heisman Trophy. Uh, first of all, Tim, you talked a little bit about what, uh, although <laughs> vaguely also, you guys are really good at avoiding questions, uh, about uh, what you... So we teach how, him. That's what we teach him. Yeah, that's what you mean. Uh, you know, you teach him well. I thought I taught him. Uh, you can ask any question, um, but we control the answer. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. Um, the, um, you've talked a little bit about, uh, about some of your goals in terms of helping promote Matt as a, as a Heisman Trophy candidate. Um, how, do you, how do you, as sports information director, help facilitate the place of USC as a national champion or our, our ability to get there? And I, I, I'll go back to our last team that, that really uh, virtually everyone outside of the NCAA said should have been playing for the national championship. Again, Mark's team was obscenely dominant. Mm -hmm. had one bad quarter in Oregon State, and it ended up costing that team uh, any uh, option, any possibility of the national championship. And, and a good portion of that had to do with perceptions about the Pac-10 at the time, uh, which is now the Pac-12. How do you go about, as sports information director, what do you personally do that facilitates building up uh, USC as a national champion or a contender for the national championship? Well, I don't do a whole lot on the wins and losses end of yep. it. That's not. That's, well, I'm, that's, he's not going to be asking him. That's his he's, job. You know, he's, um, he's not sneaking out on this. <laughs> well, I'll tell you one thing I've learned is that the to to, all, to go after the opinion shapers in the media mm -hmm. and to start with those people. There's a, a dozen, maybe 20 of them throughout the country, and get their ear and make sure they're on board with what our thought process is and, and what our facts and figures are and uh, make sure they know everything possible about our team and, and why we think you know they should consider us as whatever you're saying or Matt for the Heisman and if, if they're doing that then that their words filter down to the masses of media and uh, then it becomes more of a, of a wildfire nationally uh, so I've always kind of taken you know, to, to taking those guys and girls to, to, you know, make sure that they're on board with where we're going. Um, they have a national voice. 
and to me that's most important. The, you know, there's some people at ESPN obviously, you know, the Herb Streets and, and Corsos and, mm -hmm. and Fowlers of the world and, and uh, there's some, some key online guys that cover college football, so uh, that, that's number one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, Matt, I do realize that asking you this gives you every opportunity to give us the typical uh, athlete's pablum thing about, oh, I'm just going to try my best and all that kind of garbage. But let's 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 go beyond that, and and have a, a, a concrete statement from you. You're going to be attempting. I'll put the words in your mouth because I know you don't want to say them. You're going to be attempting to chase a, a national championship. You're going to be chasing a Heisman Trophy. What do you personally do on and off the field? and in front of the media to facilitate that. And remembering that you're not just doing this for yourself, you're doing this for your team. You represent the, the Trojan team. You represent your teammates in the media. How do you personally facilitate the media seeing this as a national champion team? I think you, you play great football and you keep your mouth shut. <laughs> <laughs> See, I said. No, I'm well, sure that's what I'm well, going to do this yeah. year. Well, that's, <laughs> that's what I think. That, that's what I'm, I'm, my focus is going to be. Uh, on winning games because that's what's going to you know, make noise and everything, winning games. But, I mean, let, letting your, your play speak for itself, letting other people talk about you. As soon as you start to open your mouth and saying we're deserving mm -hmm. of this, you know, make sure you have us in your preseason mm -hmm. watch list or anything like that, that's when you start to get you know, your brand. That's, you're shaping it in a different way. Mm -hmm. you, you, when you want, when you're attention-seeking and – you're trying to put your name out there. I, th I, th <clears throat> I think you've lost already. Yeah. And so, for for us and for me specifically this year, just just focus on you know playing Trojan ball, focusing on ourselves. I think that's what we did a great job of last year, during the season of we we kind of blocked out everything and and focused on each other and ourselves, and that produced great football. And we're gonna have to do that again. And mm -hmm. even now with more hype and the national stage and the fact that we can play for a bowl game. Um, we're, we're going to let you know people talk about that. There's already buzz now, just by the fact that we're able to play for a game. You know, we don't even we haven't even played our spring game yet, and there's already buzz just because we're you know eligible. And so, I think USC is is on a big enough stage nationally to where USC can speak for itself. Coach Kiffin can do the talking for for the players. Tim can you know handle what he handles. But for me, I mean, I think it's it really is best to just stay quiet. Mm -hmm. You know, let other people and players talk and just play good football. You know, and tell them what's written on the when you walk in the door at the football field. Well, yeah. Well, first of all, in the weight room, every every game is blocked out. It went white tape on our schedule. Every game is blocked out, so we were honed in on on that Pacific week, not looking forward mm -hmm. to, um, to to the next game or to a national championship or whatever. And then. Um, as you walk in to the field, preparation. Yeah, this is this is a coach Baxter, who's our special teams coach. He uh, he's a smart guy, but he comes up with all these funky phrases and stuff, <laughs> the mantras that you just repeat yeah. in your head all the time. But he says uh, it's all about the prep, not the hype, mm -hmm. and it, it rings true. Uh, I think in a lot of areas of life, but especially for us this year, you know, it's about how we prepare for this year. It's about how we practice, not about you know what people are saying mm -hmm. and, and all that stuff. Yeah. But seriously, you can facilitate your own job by going around telling the press what a great job Colin's doing. I can do that. Yeah. So there yes, you. always build up your offensive line. Yeah. I learned that early on. That's, that's, that's the smartest. Feed them. You can make. Feed them lots Feed of food. Feed them all you can. So yes. uh, on, on several different levels. Uh, anyway, we got plenty of time here for a few questions. Anyone have a question for uh, right here? So last year, uh, you were certainly a, I believe, most people find you a reasonable candidate to be considered for Heisman Trophy. Pat Hayden came out and said it was his fault that, that the institution didn't promote you enough. I'd be curious to know, maybe not so much from you, Matt, but from Tim, what were some of the conversations that were happening behind the scene in, in the tug and pull? And, and was there, I've been around this for a long time, Matt is certainly a, a worthy candidate. What was some of the reasoning? Well, I think what, where Pat was coming from is that um, Maybe we didn't start early enough in, in pushing him, and um, we kind of took the Carson Palmer uh, lesson and tried to strike when the iron was hot, um, which was really that last month when he was coming alive. And I still maintain that if the voting had ended a week earlier, 
he would have been in New York. I'm not sure he would have won the thing, uh, although some people back were saying that he, that he was the top guy. But there was that extra week where we weren't playing and all those other candidates were. Uh, and that, you know, the way this voting goes and the way the timing of this Heisman thing works now, it's it's almost it changes like uh, you know the waves of uh, coming in you know and and uh, we saw it with Carson uh, if Carson's the voting had ended a week earlier Brad Banks would have been the winner from Iowa and if the voting had ended a week later Larry Johnson would have won it from Penn State but the moon and the stars came right together for Carson that year so uh, I think that's kind of my perception of it so you didn't have you've been around the program Well, you know, we sat down with the, the football staff, and we sat down with um, uh, Pat and some of the higher ups, and said, "Let's let's turn it on." Um, you know, uh, earlier in the season, we didn't quite see where it was going yet. Um, and the other side of the coin is, you can throw all your coins on the table early on, and the guy flames out. And now, you, you know, your credibility, the next time you have to do it, sometimes it hurts too. So uh, there's a lot of timing involved. It's a lot like a political campaign, really. Um, and you're trying to gather delegates throughout the season, but you really want to hit the key, the key stakeholders at the right time. Mentally, uh, football, football is a team sport, not an individual sport. But mentally for you, when does this turn to be more like minor league baseball in the sense that you're trying to compete against your peers for the NFL draft and for the Heisman Trophy rather than you being the best and competing with the Trojans? What does it become about you mentally when you start competing for the Trophy and for the draft? Damn, well, better say never. <laughs> yeah. You, I don't think you can ever have that mentality um, because then you lose sight of what you're doing within your own team. And because it is a team sport, that can start to deteriorate really quickly, you know, in your season. And I think if if you're one, if you're focusing, you should be focusing on your team, how your team can win. And you know, obviously, individual improvement is important in regards to being a better player. But comparing yourself to other people is is just something I have never done. Um, you can use it as motivation, I think, to to try to kind of stack up, but to go like one versus one and try to say I'm better than him or where do I rank amongst all these guys, it, it'll never happen. I think if you just focus on being a team player first and being the best you can and, and all that stuff comes together and you're playing good, good football, then all that stuff will kind of fall into place. And so that's how I've looked at it and for since I've been playing and how I will this year. You know, along with what uh, Tim said there, I mean, you're talking throughout a body of work. There is no point of what you say, hey, I had a five-touchdown five game or a five-interception game, Never. so this yeah. changed my life. Uh, it is a, a body of work that's developed over uh, over an entire season. So you you on the one side you have to work on that body of work and developing it. Mm -hmm. On the other side, as you say, this is a this is a political campaign. This is this is a beauty contest. So you have to look pretty at the right time, uh, and and that becomes you know in in essence that's out of your hand. Other than being as consistent as you can and doing as well as you can throughout, uh, in terms of performance. The, the end game is out of your hand. Yeah, and, and that's, that's something I learned in high school with my coach, Bruce Rawlinson, he's a great coach, uh, but he said, you control the effort and God controls the outcome. It was just simple, I was a Catholic high school, so integrated God and everything, but it's, it's just a simple thing of, you know, control what you can. Mm -hmm. And I know I can't control what the media says, to a certain extent you control, but mm -hmm. you can't control what happens in other games around the country or what other people are saying about you. So. Why would I waste my effort or time trying to manipulate that when I can put my full effort into USC football and the Trojans and make that you know the best it can be? So. Yeah, and and what you get is going to come out of that. Anyway. Correct. So. Yeah. Over here. Um, this would be way down the line, and a lot of things would kind of have to fall into place. But um, if you were in a situation where you had to play under Coach Carroll again, would you welcome that opportunity <laughs> in the pros? Or do you feel like at this point you kind of would be graduated past him. <laughs> no, I, I don't see any reason why you would want to turn that down. Um, no matter, no, I mean, in, in Seattle, I think it's it's a good location, it's a good team, and I don't I don't see why you would turn down any opportunity to make more than anyone else 
pretty much in the country doing what you love. And so it's, there's times when I think it's, I don't think it's necessary, but I mean, Eli Manning and stuff declining to go to different teams, I haven't even considered that or whatever, but that is a long way down the road. And um, <laughs> But I, I have nothing against Coach Carroll, um, nothing at all. I actually talked to him before I made my decision. Um, so we, we still have a, a pretty solid relationship and don't think it would be harmful at all to play for him again. Just off the top of your head, what would be a good fit in the NFL for you? Style of oh, offense, gosh, type team. I don't know. It's interesting because a lot of the terminology and offenses that the NFL use are a lot of the stuff that we use, and that's one of the reasons why I chose USC. But um, I, I, I don't really know. It's it's one of those things that's the complete opposite than high school. You know, in high school you had your pick of the lot pretty much if you were a top tier player, and and now it's you go to the worst team if you're, if you're the top player. So. Um, yeah, when, Heisman's not looking so good now. <laughs> you know, we'll see when that time comes, you know, who stacks up, but I don't know. No. Well, you know, we don't see how Way at the back, we had a question. So, what makes you feel like unashamed or unafraid to talk about your hate? I don't know much about football, but, like, what makes you not be afraid to get, like, negative feedback or comments, like, in a particular Well, a lot of that is my personality, I'd say, and the fact that. I am, I'm a very unflappable person. I don't get phased by external factors. And uh, it, comes, it comes in handy when it comes to football, but sometimes dealing you know, with relationships with you know, my girlfriend or my family, sometimes I just I'm, I zone out to where I'm focused on something and you can't grasp the whole situation. So it has its pros and cons. But it's, it's just something that I've, I think, grown to, to comprehend and, and practice by being a quarterback because you are hit from so many angles with you know praise and adoration and people hating you for no reason at all just because they don't like your team and so over the years I've just developed uh, um, again it is my persona my personality um, but it's kind of built into my character to be able to you know you know haters gonna hate whatever you're gonna say and <laughs> focus in on what I have to do um, but I think it's just through experience. Yeah. So you're telling us your girlfriend says you don't listen to her. <laughs> I try. So is this a, we're going to start talking about a breakup of a relationship? No, no, this has nothing to do so with we her. Got, we got an LA Times reporter. You know, we could have this all over the world in a matter of seconds. Over here. What do you mean by that? Against you. How does the athletic program encourage that? Uh, how does the, I mean, I'm sure there are a set of rules, you know, about what you may or may not be able to say in the public image, but how, how are you as a player still able to, you know, express yourself to, to your friends and to the public, and how does the um, athletics department, you know, kind of make sure, how do, how do they direct players in what to be a good player? I think one of the things he's getting at is, is you represent USC, so there's a, there's, you know, in some way it respects a mold that you're supposed yeah. to fit into. But our athletic department has really also promoted <laughs> players having an individual voice and having their own personality. Yeah, I think Tim How's has, that balance work Tim out? has a lot to say on this as kind of the director yeah. of that. But from a player's perspective, the school, they, they give us um, authority to, to be ourselves. And they know that we're in college and uh, we're, we have access to these, you know, mediums of communication. and. Uh, you've seen problems pretty much all around the country of um, high school recruits take, getting scholarships taken away for something they tweet, uh, Facebook posts uh, that'll get you fired from jobs and, and everything that can be so sensitive. But um, I mean, around campus we've had um, forums, guest speakers come talk, uh, meetings with the team to discuss you know, what to and what not to say. Um, a lot of it is just common sense and pretty it really comes down to our, our number one rule on the team, which is to protect the team. Um, protect the team, make no excuses. There's a bunch of, there's three rules that goes on, but protect the team is the number one rule. And if you have that in mind when you're you know, on your computer, on your phone or whatever, if you're gonna send something out that's gonna hurt you or gonna hurt the team or harm the image of the school, um, you, know, you, you probably shouldn't, shouldn't do that. And so 
Uh, players have learned, including myself, over you know what that means. But luckily, we haven't had any too drastic situations. To no, you know, and, and we. It's a good question because we actually struggle with with that. If, if most schools throughout the country, teams, they don't let their kids on uh, social media during the season. Even some pro leagues have real stand, strict rules on when you can tweet and when you can't and, and that sort of thing. And you know, I think we've always tried to take the, the understanding that you know, the, the, we're at a university. Everybody has a voice. Everybody, the First Amendment rights, they can say what they want to say. It's our job to educate these guys uh, and girls to, to understand that there's a responsibility that they, uh, that they have now, that they're uh, student athletes at USC, that are way different than what all you guys have. You, he can go to a party with you and with you. And the three of you guys can all get in trouble. And what's Gary Klein's story the next day going to be about? It's going to be about him. And you guys are going to be others. You so know? you don't exist. <laughs> and that's, that's, that's part of the thing that we try to tell these guys is as a, as a student athlete, you lose a lot of your privileges. And it, it kind of sucks, I think, for these guys in a lot of ways. They can't do a lot of things that you guys can do. And, but, you know, we don't have hard, fast rules. We just did come out with a policy on social media that are guidelines. And in those guidelines, it's, it, there's, there is if you create a problem, do something wrong, you're subject to a uh, conversation with the, your coach and the athletic director and very kind of vague future disciplinary actions, if you will. But it isn't, you know, this, this, and this. Um, we try to let them have as much freedom that way. And, and as Matt said, we try to educate them as much as we can. I don't know how, you know, Pat Hayden, our athletic director, is very focused on this task mm -hmm. and really wants to bring in speakers and all these different ways. I don't know how many and he's times... he's the one mouthing off on Twitter already. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he just, he just went on Twitter. I don't know how many different ways we can get that message to you guys. I think you yeah. get it, but your kids yeah. and... You know you're gonna you're gonna say things, and we understand that. This college is a time to not only learn but also to make mistakes mm -hmm. for the next stage. I mean, our basic rule for you guys is if you don't want your mom to see it or hear it or read it, don't post it. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. kind of it. Well, just to, to wrap up a uh, what I started out our conversation with, uh, and it, it hits all of these points. Uh, earlier in the semester, I was standing on this stage and I was talking about something involving sports because I'm teaching a sports and social change class. Uh, and I was talking about the image, uh, I, I got to the image of athletes and the image of football players. Uh, and I landed on Matt here and I said, you know, and this, and by the way, this is all complimentary. Uh, I, I still have a, I, I was traumatized by all of this. Uh, so I, I, I said, you know, what's, what's the worst thing you can say about Matt? I mean, he's, he's like the likable Southern California guy, the Christian dude, the nice, he looks at sunsets guy. So what's the worst thing you can say about Matt? What, does he touch up his hair or something to make it more blonde? Now, two hours later, I drive home. When I get home, I'm checking my email. I've got an email from a former student who lives in Virginia. He says, did you really tear apart Matt Barkley's hair? I said, what? He said, you're trending on Twitter. You said all sorts of bad things about Matt Barkley's hair. And I, crap. Uh, so you I started that? that? Yes, I was the one who started that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so I, I remember yeah. that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I pop on Twitter. And, and it was a, you know, it was a joke. Oh, Lord, don't even get me started. I pop onto That's Twitter funny. and I check it out, and he's talking about it, and Matt Leinert's talking about it, and it's going all around the world, and now, you know, it's Durbin's the guy who ripped Matt Barkley's hair. Uh, and, and that is simply from the fact, number one, that I said it in a public place, and it wasn't anything bad. And number two, uh, what's that? <laughs> but on that side, it was, this is, by the way, you ought to feel good about this. It was the worst thing I could come up with about you. Thank you, I appreciate it. <laughs> you know, uh, and, and I was even making a joke about what's the worst thing you can say about him. But 
a student was sitting there and tweeted it, and another student saw that person's tweet, and they retweeted it. And by the time Snowball class had ended, there were 17 tweets going out on it, and it had gotten to you. And then you tweet on it, well, all your followers are like, who's ripping apart Matt Barkley's poor hair? The, you know, it's a, he doesn't even have a tube, you know? So, and then it just goes all over the world. And I'm like, you know, what, what, uh, on the one side, what a meaningless thing to be trending on. And, uh, and also what a, 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 an utterly inaccurate way to retweet tweet the conversation. But that's what happens. You're, every place now is a public place. There is, in well, a sense, welcome. no more academic freedom. Yeah. Welcome to my world. Yeah, welcome to your world, exactly. <laughs> well, that's, that's the world we all live in because the, w the moment you communicate with anyone who has a cell phone, you're communicating with the world. And, and we all are. You know, every, everybody out here may not have the stage that you have, but everybody out here has the same danger that if they say one thing in private that becomes public fodder on somebody's cell phone, and it can, uh, it, it you know, can go around the world, and the story about them being, is no longer followed in a half an hour by the truth because the truth will never, ever catch up to that story that went across the Internet. Uh, so it is a, it's, a, it's a real and present danger for everyone, obviously more so for the football thing, we should talk about ways to help them out, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, it, the same type it, of it gets back to a little bit what you guys were talking about earlier on brand reputation and brand management, and for all of you guys, too. Mm -hmm. You know, there's people, whether it's NFL general managers are looking what our guys are saying, or the NCAA is looking what they're saying. That's how North Carolina got in trouble with the NCAA because some guy tweeted about some party that he was at that had all sorts of illegal benefits going on. Uh, or, you know, IBM or Xerox or future employers. And, and same with you guys for building your brand in the future. It's amazing to me how many employers now look at yeah. Facebooks and what you've been tweeting over, over time to see is this the type of person we want. Yeah, yeah, you wouldn't believe the stories I could tell the people who graduated from here who did not get the job because of what they had on their Facebook. Um, but but we all are now in the process of public communication and building our brand. That's right. So this I, is a, a lesson to everyone. Yeah, I, I mean, I say, you know, amongst all these problems and and all the negative views social media has, I, I say embrace it because it, it has the potential for so much to carry. I mean, even with, we say, you know, all we're getting is ping, ping, ping. We don't have substance in the stories anymore. I mean, at the same time, I kind of used that to my advantage in, in my speech when I decided to come back. I knew news stories were going to take a tagline mm -hmm. and use that, and so I wanted to make sure that it was memorable by something. And mm -hmm. so I, I said unfinished business, knowing yep. that but that was going to be repeated, you know, in the, yep. in the ticker. They are going to use like a three-letter word. Yep. That's what it was. And yep. lo, lo and behold, and that's, that's what they took and ran with it. So. learned that all in 201. Exactly. Yeah. See, there you go. So I, Great class. I want to ask Gary Klein yeah. to kind of give your perspective on dealing with these guys nowadays and all that. I mean, it'd be interesting, I think, for this, this group to hear a, a real working beat writer and, you know, how you, how you see it. No, <laughs> no. This is participant observation. <laughs>
uh, I can get all of my news on Matt Barkley from Matt Barkley now. What does the LA Times do to keep itself relevant in this environment? Uh, well, not everyone is on Twitter. Not mm -hmm. everyone is on Facebook. Uh, uh, our role has changed in terms of really giving more, I think, context. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, because a lot of times controlling the message as USC has moved and other organizations have, have moved to you know, become their own news organization, we, our job is put the statement out doesn't necessarily mean that's every level of, of what's happening here at USC. That's mm -hmm. USC's you know, a statement about something that's happening. My job is to <coughs> essentially do what we've always done, to be fair and balanced, to get mm -hmm. the whole story, mm -hmm. and not just to show up at the media events that you know USC says you can show up. <laughs> My job is to be around USC. I, mm -hmm. I, I recognize some people here just from seeing the passing sure there's you know, students on this campus that have seen me hanging around Heritage Hall talking, wondering who is this guy? You know, he certainly isn't a student. Um, <laughs> so my job is to be everywhere and to try and know as much as I can know so that I can give it some truth. Basically mm -hmm. to give it fairness and balance so that mm -hmm. when people pick up the paper when they read it online, they're getting a total picture as opposed mm -hmm. to Okay, now not to embarrass you, but how many of you guys in here, show of hands, get your information and news about USC football from the LA Times? Where do you get your where do you get it from? Where do you go to to, to read about the Trojans? USC Trojans. <laughs> Our website? <laughs> we programmed them well. Now now so you're you're going to USCTrojans.com or are you going to some of those others? Because USCTrojans.com now is our voice. Okay? So you guys like our voice and you know that it's coming with a little bit of a cardinal gold filter to it. A lot of a cardinal gold filter yeah. to it. Okay. Anywhere else you guys go to? Yes, you get Bleacher report. Bleacher report. Okay. Rival. Okay. Back in, uh, oh Lord, this is going to sound awful. Back in 1979, when you started here, I was working at the Wichita Eagle. At the time, it was the Wichita Eagle and the Beacon newspaper right. in sports reporting. Uh, and we knew for a fact that we covered Kansas and we, a significant portion of Oklahoma and Western Missouri and even into Colorado. Uh, that, that the news cycle that people followed would begin with reading the Eagle in the morning and would end with reading the Beacon, for many of them reading the Beacon in the okay. evening, but especially begin with reading the Eagle in the morning. And at that time, the news cycle for people in Southern California would begin with the LA Times. This is the challenge for the Times and for journalism as a whole, uh, is that there are so many streams of sources. Uh, you, you know, the, the, the Times has to create something other than a newspaper in order to, to have a voice still. And that's a, that's a very difficult challenge. That is, again, one of the reasons why so many newspapers are folding up. Mm -hmm. So it's, 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 it's such an unhappy way to wind down the conversation. Can somebody give us a question that's really upbeat? Or, and by the way, Matt, before we end, I want you to say something really, 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 really untoward so that Gary has something to report tomorrow in the Times so that we get this whole thing in the Times because we want coverage for Annenberg. Ken? Uh, this is for Matt. What do you say to reporters after a five touchdown game and they're asking you to come in, or after you get sacked or you throw a pick? How do you respond to those kinds of very positive uh, questions and then sort of negative questions? Um, very differently. I would say for the five touchdown games, it's, it's all about the team. It's all about how great the line played. And it's all on the receivers. And for the terrible games, it's all on me. You, you always want to take the blame. So it sounds counterintuitive, but um, that's the approach I think is, uh, is the best to have and most uplifting to your team because your teammates see that you're, you know, you're supporting them in what they do and you're not putting the blame on them when you know, things go bad. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, we've had uh, Mark Sanchez say the same thing with the stage too. That, that, you know, the, that, that's really your job, especially yeah. as a spokesperson for the team. 
Uh, anything good is theirs. Anything bad is mine. Yeah. So, uh, uh, hi, Mark. I'm a student at Harvard School, and I know you also study here. And what is the best thing you got from Annenberg School? It's the best thing I got from Annenberg. <laughs> Well, considering there's two professors that I've taken here, I'm not going <laughs> to pick favorites. But well, when uh, you showed up, uh, the lessons you learned in 201, and as a sports common culture class. I don't know. I've I've learned a lot in uh, in this school that is that is pertaining to the the fast and ever changing world that we're living in, and I think Annenberg does a good job of that. I mean, I'm even in a upper division class right now that's fo kind of focused on social media. On, on, on multitasking and being being ready to be focused on your work, but you do have to you know worry about Twitter and what's going on in the world and kind of be up to date with everything while still being able to focus. But um, I mean, there's a lot, and I think I think connections here have been um, very useful, um, both in professors and teachers, but students that you know and alumni um, that that know people who know people, and uh, it's good. It's a good way to stay connected in, in the Trojan Network. Yeah. Last shot. Then we absolutely have to let you guys run up and get audience. I don't know, whatever. No questions? Oh, hey, we have one more. No, <laughs> thank you, thank you. I'm sorry? I'm from Wichita, Kansas. Now, I'm from Los Angeles, and if you tell anyone I'm from Wichita, Kansas, <laughs> you, you're not going to live the night out. I was born in Los Angeles, I will die in Los Angeles, and they will toast me and toss me into the ocean off the cliffs of Santa Monica. I was, I was in Wichita, Kansas, briefly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you, if you've been there, you know why, too. Okay, I yeah. Uh, good for Matt. Um, how did you feel about Yahoo picking up your Instagram with your girlfriend on Valentine's Day? I don't know if that's to end on a positive note or not. <laughs> It's kind of a touching note. You know? I mean, so, what is touching well, Valentine's I Day? Yeah, I, I thought it was kind of silly to tell you the truth, that that was worthy of a Yahoo headline on the front page. I mean, come on, really, a tweet is, is, is worthy like that? Um, I think it just kind of made me realize how, you know, the public profile that I am and um, how people are always willing to grab something and, and elevate that, whether that's for good or for bad, mostly for bad. Um, but it was uh, it was kind of eye opening both to my girlfriend and to, mm -hmm. to me, kind of what to expect over the next year and going into our future. Um, but I'm because I've never really mentioned her or my family really, my personal life, that personal on on Twitter just for their sake and for their protection. And probably that will be the last time that I <laughs> that I do from <laughs> from here on out. But learned a lot. It was a good lesson. And so now you know why about. Yahoo stock is down. You know, <laughs> uh, they can't keep anything secret. All right, we want to thank very much Tim Tesselone, the Sports Information Director for your USC Trojans. <laughs> and Matt Barkley, the quarterback, assuming he doesn't do, lose the job, uh, the quarterback for your USC <laughs> Trojans now and uh, in the coming years. <laughs> and thank you very much for showing up. I'm sure they'll stick around here for a couple of minutes and say, shake hands and say anything, ask any, Thanks, answer guys. any questions for you want to ask. Thank you. Man, what a lousy way to end. <laughs> Sorry. You guys are awesome. Have a great night. <laughs>